Hello and welcome to Dream Deals, the programme that traces the history of some of the world's most popular cars. Now this week we're in Essex to see why one manufacturer in particular has been able to over the years build not only some of the world's best selling cars but also some of the most desirable. Worked out who it is yet? Maybe these will help. That's right, this week we're looking at the famous blue oval of Ford. The now legendary Henry Ford established the Ford Motor Company in 1903. The company's home was of course Detroit, Michigan, USA, but it wasn't long before Uncle Henry set his sights on the UK. In fact, shortly after the company's inauguration in the States, Ford of Britain was created. Now over the next couple of years, the company's profile increased thanks to cars like the Model A and the Model N, but there was one car that was staggeringly successful in the United States and encouraged the company to begin production here in the UK. A famous car with a famous slogan, you can have any colour you want so long as it's black. <laughs> he was a right cad, Henry Ford, wasn't he? It is, of course, the very famous Model T. Although the first Model T was launched in 1908, it wasn't until 1911 that the first British-built Model T rolled off the production line in Trafford Park, Manchester. Over the next few years, sales in the UK flourished, and by the time production ended 16 years later, 300 cars had been produced. Now, the Model T is probably the first supercar, if you like, because it was so significant. It brought cars to the masses. Now, bold claims have been made about the Model T, but let's not get carried away. It wasn't a car for everybody. It was strictly a car then for the medium well-off, the middle classes, the new industrial classes of the beginning of the 20th century. And, of course, rich frogs, because Toad of Toad Hall, of course, drove one. Pop, pop. Now this car is a little belter, it's got two forward gears, one reverse gear and it develops about 20 odd horsepower and uh, it's a nice tidy little car. Nowhere near as rough as I thought it would be, obviously you've got quite a bit of shakeage looking at me but it really is very comfortable because of its leaf springs that make it absorb a lot of the bumps so it really is a tidy little car. The weirdest thing about this car is that you have to put your foot off the clutch to go faster. So if I want to speed up here, I use my accelerator on the side of the steering wheel and I actually put my foot on the clutch to engage the engine. And then hopefully we go a bit faster. I use my accelerator and then I take the handbrake off curiously and then put my clutch right down and then take it off and then we're in top gear and we're tootling along again, fine styly. Now, unlike modern cars, the Model T of 1925 was largely the same as the Model T of 1909. It had the same four-cylinder engine, the same straight-sided frame, and the same three-point leaf springs. The only difference was the way it was made. Now, with over 15 million cars made, it meant that the future for Ford was certainly bright. The only question was now, could they top it? And try they did, because over the next 40 years or so, Ford produced some of the most popular cars in the UK. Who can forget? The Anglia, the Prefect, the Consul, and perhaps the most famous of them all, the Zephyr. But despite the success of all of those cars, it was what was to follow that really grabbed the attention of the British public. Launched in 1962 and originally called the Consul Classic and Consul Cortina, the Ford Cortina would go on to become the most successful of cars the company would ever produce, outshining not only other manufacturers but also a rival from Ford of Germany. The British built and designed Cortina was cheaper, faster and more economical than anything else in its class. Now although the car was produced until 1982, perhaps the most fondly remembered model was the Lotus tuned Cortina of 1963. Under Underneath the car's standard shell was a tuned 1.6 engine and uprated suspension. Although the road-going versions were a little difficult to drive, on the track they were special and unbeatable with wins in the European Saloon Car Championship and numerous rally events. To continue the success that the company had been enjoying was always going to be difficult. With every new car there was the chance that the country's love affair with all things Ford could come to an end. But even the most optimistic person at Ford could not have anticipated just how successful the replacement for the Anglia was going to be. Launched in 1968, the Escort looked and was a conventional front-engine rear-wheel drive car. But what made it stand out was the way it was made, with a new process developed to ensure better fitting panels. 
just as at home on the school run as on a muddy hillside, the Escort captured the hearts and minds of the British public. Combining good vehicle dynamics, style and affordability, the Escort was the car to be seen in. And the thing was that the kids who had once been taken to school in the back of their mum's Escort grew up wanting one of their own, only with a little more power. And they weren't to be disappointed, as the Escort came in many sporting guises. There was the Escort RS 1600, the Mexico and the RS Turbo, and of course everyone's favourite, the XR3i. Now over the next 30 years, the Escort would go on to become Britain's favourite family hatch, with everyone from my mum to Princess Diana owning one. But in 1998, time was called and the Escort was retired. Its replacement was a car designed for the millennium, the all-new Focus. Now, whilst we're on the subject of icons, we couldn't possibly let the 70s go by without mentioning the one car that made them worthwhile. But before I reveal it, does this ring any bells? Believe in me, mate, I was born tall, dark and beautiful. And engagingly modest, of course. The professionals! Bodie, Doyle! What do you mean you don't remember? Rolling across bonnets! Well, if you don't remember it, you'll remember this. Launched in 1969, the Capri was hailed as the car you always promised yourself with its long bonnet and 2 plus 2 styling. The Capri was the Mustang of Europe. But although the styling was all new, the car's underpinnings relied on the Cortina. At launch, it was available with a wide range of engines and specifications, but it was the high-performance models that got all the attention. And they didn't get much more powerful than this, the Capri 280 Brooklands. Underneath its now longer and softer looking body was a 2.8 litre V6 engine, generating 160 brake horsepower. Performance as a result was impressive, 0-60 dispatched in under 8 seconds and a top speed of 127 miles per hour. Now when the Brooklands first came out, I was just a lanky, spotty 16 year old with pictures of cars like this on my wall. But now, oh, how things have changed. Now I get paid to drive them on tracks like this for free. Now the thing about the Ford Capri is that you tend to look at it through rose-tinted spectacles. In other words, the longer you look back at it, the more you think that was a great car, fondly loved by millions. But the truth is, it wasn't really. The truth is, it was a bit of a joke. It was Gary and Dave who lived down the road, who had sun strips in the windscreen and were going out with Sharon and Tracy. It was the original Essex boy car. But don't let that detract from the fact that the car drives and handles really quite well for something this old. And don't be put off either by the smaller engine Capris. They really weren't worth writing home about. You had to have a V6 and you had to have a 2.8 or a 3 litre engine. Now they were worth writing home about because they were rear wheel drive, they handled something like a sports car and they were absolutely brilliant fun. And the other thing about the Capri was that its shape was a beautiful shape and it meant that all of the styling kits and all the Max Power Brigade, which didn't exist in those days, could really get to grips and soup up your Capri to make it look something special. It was one of the first cars to do that. Everyone would admire the Capri down the road with a great big sports kit on it. It was a 1.6 and couldn't pull the skin off the proverbial, but it still looked fantastic because of its 2 plus 2 coupe shape. It really was striking and it was one of the most recognisable cars too. There was no mistaking a Capri when it went down the road. Now sadly the Capri ceased to be in 1986, but not before 1.9 million cars had been made and sold across the world. Years later Ford tried to recreate that Capri magic with other coupes like the Probe and the Cougar, but ultimately it failed. 